So was that a helpful discussion? Um, yes. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Ella. I always trust Ella to be honest, because Ella, if she she'll just say to me, "No, that was terrible. Please don't do that again." I'm just joking. That was good. So, guys, uh, I know there's a few, there's a few of us here. Um, for some reason, I think some people they signed up, but then they maybe couldn't make it for some reasons. So I was getting excited because I was like, "Whoa, whoa!" Ten people, and then I got told that there was more than ten people coming, and then uh, now you're depressed. Is now I'm depressed. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so we we have the, the good news is there's a lot of people who join us online. So if you're joining us online, that's awesome. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to carry on in the book of Job. Um, and you guys have been reading it now. I want to say to you uh, two, well, actually three quick things. One is this book is actually a very challenging book to read. Uh, so it's actually good that we preach through it because uh, I needed a lot of help in actually reading this book. I spent a lot of time reading commentaries. I walk around and I chat to the other guys who are preaching through the books. I chat to Royden, I chat to Martin. Um, and it's it's been actually a really good thing for my soul because I found I've been wrestling with this book. And that's a good thing. If you read your Bible and you're wrestling with something, that's a really good thing. Um, the second thing as I quickly want to say is that last week I, I preached on chapter one uh, and I found that there was a certain aspect of the passage that I actually hadn't taught on. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to preach on chapter one and chapter two and hopefully not to be, might not be too long. Um, and then the third thing I, I want to say is that, um, that this talk is going to be difficult to listen to because the book of Job is hard. So it's difficult. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I know it's the morning and I know you probably had hectic weeks at school because like exam time's coming. Oh, good. No, no hectic weeks at school. Okay, that's great. So that means you have brain power now. So whatever you do to concentrate, do it. If that means you have to just quickly stand up and stretch for a few seconds, just do that. If, it, if you need to take notes, pull out your phones. I don't mind as long as you're not WhatsApping people. <laughs> take notes on your phones, whatever you can do, because it's going to be, this is in for a rough ride. I'm letting you know that up front. Okay. So let me pray for us. Okay. Father God, we just thank you so much that you are the God of the universe, that you are in control of everything. Um, and that no matter what happens in our lives, you remain God. And that is an incredible truth, that your worth is not determined by my life. Uh, and so, Father, I just pray now that your spirit will work in me. I really need your help. Um, this isn't easy. And we all need your help. Um, when it's tough passages, we know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can work and can make it understandable to us. So we pray that you do that. Amen. Okay. There are two different ways that people view their relationship with God. Either God exists to serve us. That's option number one. Or number two is we exist to serve him. So in the first way where he exists to serve us, God's purpose is to serve humanity. In other words, God's sole existence is for our benefit. He's there for our good. He's there for our well-being and generally our lives. You can, you can tell which people believe in this way of relating to God by the way that they pray. Their prayers are only about themselves and very little about God's plan for the world. Because in the back of their mind, God is really for them. Okay? So they'll ask God to look after their relationships, their studies, their families, their careers, their health their problems, etc. But there's almost nothing in their prayers about God, his kingdom, and the salvation of those around them. This is actually the wrong view of our relationship with God. Because while the Bible says that God does serve us, God doesn't exist for us. That's not the reason he's around. God is actually completely happy in himself. So he doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. So the fact that he actually serves you at all is a sheer act of grace. He doesn't exist for you. He doesn't exist to serve you. In this view, what happens is what you do is you put God as something that revolves around you. Like the sun goes around the earth. That's wrong, right? Sun doesn't go around the earth. In fact, the earth goes around the sun. And that's why I'm getting to the second biblical way that we relate to God. And this is the biblical one. 
We exist to serve God. In this view, God is at the center. And like the earth goes around the sun, so we revolve around God. In this view, we are just one of a billion people who serve an infinitely huge God. And in comparison to him, we are so infinitely small that we just appear like a little dot on the dot that's called the Milky Way. Do you know the Bible says that God holds the universe in the palm of his hands? That is how tiny we are. And if you think we are just one in a billion people who are worshiping this God, we are very insignificant. And so the fact that God actually says in the Bible he loves us is an incredible mind-blowing thing. The fact that he does anything for us at all, the fact that he even gives us attention is actually an act of grace. So I want to quickly show you this in the Bible to show you that the second view of relating to God is actually the biblical one. So I want us to look at Ephesians 1. So just quickly hop to Ephesians 1. I'm going to go there as well. It's in the, it's in the uh, New Testament, second half of your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1. Just keep your, keep your, your fingers in Job, so don't lose Job. Okay. 976 if you're in the uh, church Bibles. So in Ephesians chapter 1, we get what God's plan is for the world. We see his mission. And his mission is actually something that he brings us into. It's not the other way around. His mission isn't us. His mission is actually his own glory, and he brings us into it. So if you don't want to quickly see the goal of his mission, uh, it's in verse 12. Here's the goal. Here's what he wants to achieve. So just a quick, quick little thing before I mention verse 12 is he's chatting to two different types of people here. He's chatting to Jewish people who have become Christians, and he's chatting to non-Jewish people, which the Bible calls Gentiles, who have become Christians. Okay, two groups of Christian people, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And he first speaks to the, the, uh, the Jewish Christian, and he says in verse 12, so that we, the Jewish people, were the first to hope in Christ, and that's because Christianity came to Jewish people first before it went to the rest of the world. Uh, hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We're there to praise him. He's not there to praise us. That's the, that's the goal. Carry on reading. Uh, so that we were the first, uh, verse 12, verse 13, in him you also, which is now the Gentile people, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the Gentiles and Jewish Christians, what's the goal? God wants to be praised. He wants our lives to be for him, not the other way around. So how does he go about doing this? Well, then you go back back in the passage and you'll see that God had a plan way before the world began. So he actually, he wanted us to, be, to, to praise him and he created like a whole plan, a whole mission of how he was going to do that. And it starts in verse three. It says, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. And, this, and it tells us his plan. It says, skip down to just the end of verse four. It says, in love, he predestined us for adoption. So in his planning room, I don't know if God had the planning room before the world began, but he sat down and he was like, I want to adopt some people. I want to rescue people, bring them to myself. So I want to adopt them. So that's what he thought of before the world began. And then what happens during, during, the, during history? So before history, during history, he brings Jesus to come and rescue us. So it says, uh, carry on reading verse 5, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, against the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. And here it tells us what happened in history. In him, in Jesus, we have a de redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to his riches. So Jesus saved us in history. What happens at the end? If you skip down all the way to verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So at the end of history, one day we're all going to be together with God. So God has a plan for the world, and he invites us into it so that we praise him. So I'm showing you this because this is a biblical view of how God made the world. Now, you're probably looking at me going, but I know all this stuff. But I want to show you that actually, although we know this, we actually live a very different way. And so we're going to see that in the book of Job, these two ways of actually relating to God are shown. And in the end, 
The second view is the only one that will actually stand if you are under trial. It's the only one that actually works. So last week, we looked at the first five verses of Job chapter one, and we saw that Job was nearly a perfect guy. So you can go back to the book of Job chapter one, and you'll see it in verse one there. It says that he was, uh, he had a good standing in society. So that, that they used the word upright. That means he has a good standing in society. He says he was blameless, which doesn't mean that he was perfect, guys. So he wasn't completely sinless. But what Job did every morning was he would wake up. And in those days, if you wanted to get forgiveness from the Lord, you would have to sacrifice animals. And so what he would do is he would sacrifice an animal. And in that way, he'd receive forgiveness from God. I'm not going to explain that all again now. If you want to explain that, that you can listen to last week's sermon. So he was almost blameless. Uh, he feared the Lord. We also spoke about that last week, which means that he, it's not that he's petrified by God. It means that he's petrified of what God could do if he steps over a line. And we used that kind of illustration last week where we said, it's like your parents. You don't freak out when your parents enter the room. But what you do freak out is when you know that you're in trouble because you know what they can do. So that's the kind of fear we have for the Lord. We love the Lord. We, we have a great relationship with him. And one of the reasons we have that is because we know that if we cross the line, there's consequences to our negative actions. So that's the kind of fear that he has. So he fears the Lord. He's, he's an upright guy. He's blameless. He's pretty much the perfect guy in so many ways. Uh, and in return for that, because of his righteousness, because righteous means his good standing with God. Because he's got a great relationship with God, God blesses him. And so he gets given children, which as we saw last week, is like the kind of blessing. So children were seen as such a great blessing. It was like the equivalent of getting really fancy cars now. You know, people say they're blessed when they get a really fancy car. People would say they're blessed back then when they had lots of children. He also had a lot of cattle, which is a symbol for wealth. Some cultures today still have that. If you have a lot of cattle, it means that you're wealthy. So he was a wealthy guy. He was blessed with lots of children. He had lots of stuff. In, in Job's eyes, he was actually living the good life. Because think about it. He's got a good relationship with the God of the universe. He's got a great family. And if you look in the text, in verse 4, it talks about the fact that his family frequently had parties where they really enjoyed themselves. It was a great time. They were living their best lives. He probably had a fancy house. He probably did everything because he was blessed by the Lord for the things that he did. God gave him good for being a good person. Everything is looking so amazing. And this then leads to the next section where everything falls apart. So everything just looks good. It's like this utopic lifestyle. It's just this real paradise that he has. Everything gets thrown on its head. So if you look from verse, from verse 6, God calls this heavenly meeting. And he gathers everyone. And he spe- everyone in the heavenly realms. Specifically Satan comes into the meeting. So Satan is kind of specified here. And God talks to Satan. And God says, look at my servant Job. Look how righteous and blameless and upright he is. There was no one like him. He's really bolstering Job. And now here is where we see Satan is really clever. Because Satan knows that God wants people to follow him in the second way. To relate to him in the second way. And he knows God wants people to serve God and not relate to God in the first way. Which is when God is only existing for your own personal gain. So Satan looks at the relationship between God and he says, how do you know that Job doesn't serve you for the things you give him? Look at the text, verse 9b. It says, does Job fear God for no reason? And then he says, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? Lord, you've blessed the work of his hands and the possessions have increased in the land. But I tell you what, God, if you stretch out your hand on all that he has, he will curse you to your face. In other words, Satan is saying, how do you know that Job is actually in this relationship for, for you? Because he may be it for, in it for himself. And he says two things. He says, look, God, you give Job security. Verse 10, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? And secondly, he says in verse, uh, in verse 10, the second half of verse 10, he says, you have blessed the work of his hands. 
and his possessions have increased in the land. So because God just keeps giving him good things, Job is, Satan is like, how do you know that he's not in this for himself? Think about it, God. Every time Job does something good, you just give him security and you just give him stuff. How do you know that Job is not the self-centered person who's like, this is great. All I have to do is I just pay my dues for the Lord. And in return, look at all the stuff I get. I get a great house. I get a great car. I get all these securities in my life. My family gets looked after. I get blessed. In fact, look at, the, look at what happens to me in the end. If you look in verse 3, it says this. It says, Job was the greatest man. So let me just double check that verse. Yes, in a verse, verse 3, it says, he was the greatest man, the greatest of all people in the East. It's like, God, I just pay my dues and you make me the greatest person. I become this awesome celebrity because I do good things for you. So Satan devises this test, and it's a good test. He says, you want, you want to see Job's heart if he's really in this relationship for you, for himself? Do this. Take away all those blessings you give him. Take away the security, nice house, the comfy life. Take it away and see if he still trusts you. And then Satan says, you know what I bet? I bet he, won't, he will not only not trust you, but he will curse you to his fa your face. You'll say things. So to curse God basically means that you say stuff that is not worthy of him. So you lower his worth. So he's a loving God. So you say, God, you are not loving. You can't be loving if you're allowing this to happen to me. Or God is a powerful God. You say, God, you're not powerful. What have you done to help me in my situation? Or you get angry at God and you turn away from him because you think that he is not worthy of a relationship with you. That's when you curse God. And Satan is right. And there are many of you here today, and you serve God like this. You are only in the relationship for what God gives you. Instead of finding your security in God, you feel secure because you have a nice home. Or your future feels secure because you've got a good education. And there are times in your life where you don't feel like life is secure, but that's just because you don't know the future yet. But the moment the future becomes clear, you go, Whew. Now I'm secure. And you're probably in those moments, praise God, because you'd be like, oh, God, like I was worried about my, my exams. I was worried about my studies. But, you know, now I can see that I'm actually not doing so badly. Thank you, Lord. You're finding your securities not in God, but in the things that he gives you. You are like this. And the, the, the times when you praise God the most is probably when everything goes well in your life. If your life does not look rocky, in other words, if it's secure and a lot of good things are happening in your life, then you praise God and you won't curse him. But if you are like this, then when God takes something away, you'll curse him. Why? Because suddenly it feels as if he's a good God. Because it, it, so, Sorry, you'll think this. If he's a good God, then he won't... And he'll maintain the securities in my life. He'll maintain the studies. My home, my family, he'll keep working hard to look after those things. And then, you know, if I just stay being a good person, if I'm going to church, and if I'm just kind of at least staying on the right path, if I'm working hard at my exams, and surely a good God will then bless me with a great job when I finish school or someone great to marry. Because that's what he is. He's a good God, isn't he? Sia Khaleesi is the South African rugby captain, in case you didn't know that. Thanks, Ella, for laughing. That's good. I still have to say that, even though most people know who he is. And let me tell you, he's a legend, okay? I was one of those proud South Africans, like, cheering him on when he captained the South African rugby side for the first time. Because that was a momentous day. I don't know if you guys remember that, but the South African rugby team had been basically failing for a whole year. They hadn't won a game. And then he came in, and he captained the side, and not only did he win that game, but he won the next game. And then he took South Africa to win the World Cup. What a legend. And what a change in our history, because you guys know the story. Rugby is often associated with white Afrikaners. And here this black guy comes in, and he's amazing, right? He takes rugby. He, he kind of makes rugby multicultural at the same time. 
not that it was multicultural before, but he, you know what I mean? He kind of makes it more accessible to everybody else. And he proved a lot of South Africans wrong. All those white racist people, he proved, no, a black South African can do amazing stuff if he takes his team on. It was a powerful time in our history. Everyone was like, see it, Khaleesi. And you know what, like sometimes I do this, I don't know if you, you do this, but when you find like a celebrity that you really love, you kind of nerd out. You like, you sort of try and stalk them as much as you can online. Not, not in the sense that you like find their Facebook profile and you like, let's be friends. Not like that. You, you like, you, you know, like you start following them on, on Instagram as as follower. You, you like Ellis, just, she's just going like this the whole time. She's, she's so embarrassed by me right now. Um, but you, you do things like you, 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 uh, you kind of like, you just want to get to know them online. So you start reading up about them. I became like that. And then I discovered that he was a Christian. And if you're a Christian and you find another Christian celebrity, because it's so rare, you freak out even more. I was properly nerding out. I was like, yeah, he's a Christian. He loves Jesus. That's so amazing. <laughs> I was so excited, okay? And now after the World Cup, what he did was he did this YouTube, he, he did this, um, he spoke at Hillsong. And I was so excited. So I was there watching on YouTube, like, you see how Khaleesi's giving his testimony at Hillsong. This is so awesome. And I sat and I was listening. And, uh, and I was, he mentioned God and he brought God in and he's talk, talked about how if it wasn't for God, he wouldn't have his uh, sporting career that he did. And, and then he ended and he gave his microphone to the guy who was interviewing him. And I was like, but wait, you haven't finished. Actually, if you're sharing your testimony, you talk about how Jesus saved you. Like, why did you just talk about how Jesus blessed your career? And I was like... Now, I, I don't want to, I don't want to judge Sierra at all. It could have just been maybe they edited a part of it out or maybe just ran out of time. I don't know. But one of the things I thought, and this could be it, is that perhaps Sia Khaleesi's relationship with the Lord is that he only trusts God for the stuff that God gives him. I thought about it and I thought, I kind of pictured Sia like, if this is true, and again, I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying if this is true and he serves God in the first way, but God is all about him, then I pictured him perhaps maybe when he was a kid praying to the Lord, saying, Lord, please help me in my rugby, please help me in my studies so that I can have time to practice, Lord, please look after my family. Please look after my dad. Please look after my mom. And as he grew older and he started realizing he was getting good at rugby, he was like, Lord, please make sure that I have the right coaches, that I get into the right teams. And nothing is completely wrong with these things. But do you see something? His relationship has got nothing to do with God. It's all about himself and how God does things. And I can imagine that when he, he, he got into the South African rugby side, he probably praised the Lord. Thank you, Lord. My dreams have been achieved. Everything that you and I have been working towards, God, because remember, God, you are on my mission. I'm not in yours. So, God, you're part of my team. So everything that we've been working towards, Lord, has finally happened. And then, you know what? God blessed him, and he became the South African rugby captain. At that point, he was probably going to church every Sunday saying, Hallelujah, Lord. Right? And then I had this thought. What if, what if God didn't give him his dreams? What if he broke his leg when he was a kid? I can tell you now, if he viewed God in the first way, if that's how he related to God, he would curse God to his face. He would say things like, God, we were a team. You knew how much this meant to me, how I've worked hard towards it. God, if you loved me, you'd never let this happen to me. You'd curse God. You're not loving. You're not good. You don't care. All those things God is worthy of being called, and you're telling him he's not. If he's powerful, he would have stopped this from happening. He would have never let this happen. If he cared, I'd still be playing rugby. Now, as I look over you guys, and I'm looking towards the people online as well, I'm aware that there are people who are in relationships with God 
where God is just there to serve them. It's not the other way around. Here's a test. If you want to find out if you are in this field, here's a test. Here's a few questions you can ask yourself. Is your prayer life more about yourself than it is about God? Question number one. Do you have interest in get do you, do you actually have interest in getting to know God? Or is it that just as long as you're praying to God or going to church and you feel like you're on good terms with him? Do you praise God more for the victories that you've achieved instead of praising him because he is worthy of your praise and because of his achievements at the cross? Are you only happy in your relationship with God when your relationships, your family dynamics, and your school life are going well? Or do you curse God when your relationships, your family dynamics, and your school life are not going well? So our time is running short, so I just want to quickly get to the, the, the last little bit. I want to show you Job's response. Because Job's response blew my mind. So Job kind of has this hectic time where he suffers. Um, we didn't read it today, but we saw it last week. He loses everything. He has the worst kind of suffering you can imagine. Because he goes from completely having everything, this most blessed utopic life, to having nothing. He loses his family. He loses his his. Uh, all the property that he, that he owns, uh, he, he eventually sits with nothing. And then what happens is uh, Satan uh, comes and attacks him again, and his health is taken. And if you look at the beginning of chapter two, that's what you would have read, that he's, he gets to this point where he's sitting in an ash heap. That basically means that you had the ash heap was outside of the city. It was like basically the worst part of the city that you could go to. Uh, and it's a symbol. He's gone from the most blessed you could ever be to the, down, the worst, the most down and out you could ever be. And in fact, he hits depression. Because what he does is he starts taking like sharp instruments to cut into his sores. And you know that often when people suffer from depression, they cut themselves. And it's because they want to feel something and they can't. He gets depression. I mean, that is hectic suffering. I pray that none of us will ever go through that. And yet, in all this, he says, what we, talk, what we looked at last week, he says, verse 21, it's my favorite verse in the whole book of Job. This is Job's response to, to all the suffering. He says, naked I came from my mother's room, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, in all of this, God's reputation is not lowered in his life. He still holds God in a high regard. He still worships him and he still praises him. He says something similar at the end of chapter two. His wife speaks to him and then he responds and he says, he says, look at the second half of verse 10. He says, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In other words, he's like, God, you are still in control. I will, my view of you is not going to change. You are still in control of everything. You still take away things and you still bring things. And shame his poor wife, she was just really caring for him. And he says to her in, at the end of chapter two, there, he says, you're speaking of one that is foolish. In other words, he actually holds her in a high regard. And he says, you don't speak like this normally. You're an amazing person. But today you're speaking like somebody foolish. Because it is foolish to ever think that God lowers his value when you suffer. Job never curses God. Here's why. It's because Job knows something. If you can just give me a little bit more brain power, just for this last little bit. It says, God's worth is not determined by what he does and does not do for you. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine Nelson Mandela was still alive today, right? And he came to you and he said, I'm going to be doing some big stuff in South Africa. And I want you to join me. Now, I know that you don't have any qualifications in politics, but that's okay. I'll help you along. Now, just the fact that he's coming to you would be like this massive honor, right? Here is the, like, probably the most amazing South African that has ever lived. And he's coming to you. 
And he says this, even if you say no, because you might feel a bit too uncomfortable, you'd still feel really honored, right? I mean, here you are, and, and he's actually acknowledged how worthless you are in a sense, because he's like, no, you don't have qualifications. You, 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 you shouldn't really be part of this team, but I'm gonna bring you to be part of my team, okay? You would be honored. Thank you, Mr. Mandela. You'd say, Mr. Mandela, you wouldn't say, hey, Nelson. You would be respectful because of how great he is. You'd be like, uh, sorry, Mr. Mandela, but uh, unfortunately, I, like, I've got to finish my schoolwork or something. Or you'd say, yes, sign me up. I'm joining you, Mr. Mandela. Just be respectful at the end. The one thing you would not do is you would not do, you'd not go like this. You'd be, you wouldn't say this, excuse me. What makes you think you are so great? You know what, Mr. Mandela? You need to prove your greatness to me. Go make me a sandwich. <laughs> you would never do that, right? Hello. <laughs> and the, pro the, the, the thing about Mr. Mandela is he'd probably go and make you a sandwich because he's just that much an amazing person. But you would never say that. Why? Because when you look at Mr. Mandela, immediately you remember in your head most of the things that he's done in the past which have made him great. It's not him relating to you that makes him great. He is great. Because you look at all the things that he's done and you're like, you are worthy. You're a worthy man. You would never dare to say, make me a sandwich. And it's the same with Job. When Job looks at God, he sees all the good things that God has already done. God doesn't have to serve him and make him a sandwich in order for him to be great. All he does is he looks at God and he goes, you know what? I'm suffering, but if I look at all the things that you've done, remember, I am just one of a billion people that are following you. I'm just one. And if I look at all the stuff that you've done in those billions of people's lives, here's one thing that I see. I see you are the God who created everything. And I can tell from the way you created everything that you are a good God. And this is the one thing that we don't do with Jesus. We look at our suffering and we go, God doesn't make me a sandwich. God doesn't serve me. Therefore, he is not worthy of me. And we tend to say, we tend to curse God. Because when we look at God in our suffering, suddenly God should be all about us. But if we had to take this perspective and look at God and say, God, you're not just in a relationship with me. You actually have a mission for the world. And you are serving billions and billions of different people. And the one thing that I can see when I look at you, like, like we do when we look at Mr. Mandela and we see the history of what he's done, we look at God and we see one massive event that he did to save everybody. And we go, he is worthy of my respect, regardless of what he does. Because look at how much he loved humanity. Like in the same way we look at Mr. Mandela and we go, look at how he saved our country. We can look at God and we can go, look at how he saved the world. Now, when you do that, the last final thing I want to say to close off is this is how this changes you when you suffer. When you're going through trials and you're going through tribulations, Take a, take a step back and realize that you are not in this for God serving you. You are in this because you're serving God. And what this means is you can look at him and you can go, okay, God, I don't know why I'm going through the struggles, but I can look at you and I can see that no matter what happens in my life, you are still worthy. And I can see that not only are you a great God, but you are a loving God because what you did 2,000 years ago is you saved the world. You must love us. So therefore, when I'm struggling, I know that you are a good God. And though I can't see the good yet, I know that there is something good to happen in my struggles. And when you've done that, when you think that way, this, these are the words that you can say to the Lord. You can say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, I've spoken for a long time. We're going to pray, and we're going to sing some songs. So uh, let me pray for us quickly. Father God, I just want to thank you for uh, everything that you've done for us. I want to thank you that you are a great and glorious and powerful God. I want to thank you that we can say, <laughs> you give and you take away, but I'll still see you as the blessed Lord. I will still praise your name because your worth doesn't change because of me. You are worthy, no matter what. Thank you, Lord, and I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, just before we do some singing, um, 
there's we just I just want to show you a quick little video thing. Uh, this is just so James. I don't know if you can uh, if you can show that. Um, it also you guys also see it on the Zoom thing now. Um, I just wanted to show you something you can do with your phones to kind of if you have an Android phone. Here's an Android phone. Okay, so if you have an Android phone, here's what you can do. Um, when it starts playing, I'll show you. Um, so you just need to share the second screen on. Okay, ah, there we go, it's coming live now. Uh, uh, okay, just click at the top right of your screen where it says go live. There's a little like an icon, it says go live. Yeah, top right of your screen. So you'll see it says output. Sorry, it says like volume. So you can see it says temp, uh, template, format, output. And you can also stop recording because this is not interesting. <laughs> Actually, no, no, keep recording this. That's fine. Keep recording this. I want people to see this. Uh, okay. So I'll just explain it while while it's is struggling. Um, so what you can do is if you you've got do you have your phone on you now? No. Okay. So if you go on your phone. And um, really, actually, need this video to work. It'd be great. Um, you can't. Oh, it is playing. Okay. Okay. Then just push. Uh, then just push play. Sorry, I'm not realizing. Okay. You can see if you go to the Christchurch Modern website on your phone, it somehow just exploded the video. Like I don't know why. And then if you go to, uh, so you click on the little menu button that you saw there, and you click on uh, teens. Then at the top right of your phone, if you click on those, those three little buttons at the top right, you see the very top right of the screen, and you scroll down on the menu, you can add to your home screen um, the page. And then what it'll do is if I now exit out of the, the web page and I go on my phone and then I scroll to the right, it creates like a little icon. And then uh, a little green icon there which says Illumination Youth, you select that and it immediately takes you to the page. And so this way you can always keep up to date with what's going on in teens. And if you scroll down this page, it'll show you everything that's happening. And I just want to mention, so uh, there's the page, so it's scrolling down. And uh, I just want to mention one little event that's happening, which is, I'm going to select on it now, uh, is events coming up is social distancing picnic. So it's our picnic next week. So it's on Saturday next week. So cancel your plans if you have any plans next week on Saturday. I don't care if it's a meeting with... Uh, the president, if Nelson Mandela actually does come and speak to you, just cancel with Nelson and just say you're coming to this. So it's going to be in the morning. Uh, you can see the time is from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So you can join us for that. Um, so you must, no, no, so I can't feed you. I'm not allowed to because of COVID. So you have to bring your own picnics. So bring your own picnics. Bring, you can bring sports equipment or whatever. We're going to have some fun. We'll just, it's at the Bowley Bird Sanctuary. Uh, and on that page is a link to the map. So you can come join us for that. It's gonna be really awesome. And one other thing is on that same page, you will find all our details for, um, for Friday night. So you can come and join us. Uh, we are meeting in person here from six uh, until eight. Uh, if you can't join us in person, join us online. Um, so really cool to see your faces in the flesh. Um, we like your faces, we wanna see you. Um, so yeah, come join us. That's it. Now we're going to do some praise and worship, and you can stop the recording. Um, the original sound off. Uh.